be the, the nucleus of the entire thing that we're arguing about. So can we look at the dispute? Can we look at the contract? And can we satisfy the question or the issue just from looking at the contract only? And if the answer is yes, then what the judge does is that they exclude all of the other evidence. Here's a practical application of how that can be important. Let's say you're under contract. You know, today we have a whole lot of earnest money on the line. We have a lot of option money on the line. And for some reason now your client wants to cancel. You're representing the buyer. Your client's option period has expired. The HOA contingency has expired. The objections paragraph has expired. And the only piece left that your client has that they could cancel underneath is going to be the third party financing addendum. And when we start looking at the contract, we realize that the third party financing addendum may have been signed, but the box was never checked in the contract. So now the argument at heart is going to be, does your buyer have the right to terminate under the third party financing addendum? Clearly not because the box wasn't checked. And so if you're looking in that discovery piece of the lawsuit, the pretrial evidence piece, the judge is gonna say, I realize you have all these boxes of evidence. I realize that you have a text message where you discussed third-party financing with the other agent. You know, I realize that you have the third-party financing signed. You have all these emails where you negotiated the terms, but we're gonna apply the four corners of the document doctrine, look only at the contract and the contract answers our question. So none of the other evidence can be spoken to. So that's why I think it's really important to to focus on the contract because it is the driving piece that many times will cure or kill an issue when we're going through litigation. That's why we're having this whole class. So I want you to keep those two concepts in mind as we go through the, the paragraphs because they'll, they'll come up later as well. All right, um, another legal concept that I like to talk about is point of discovery and we can use paragraph one for that. Um, when we deal with paragraph one, I want y'all to all think about a situation where you've written up a contract, you've turned it into title, and we have given you back a title commitment. And on our title commitment, something doesn't match for the parties that are in title. A couple of reasons this can happen to you, and it's always a surprise, or it's usually a surprise. There might be a death in the chain of title. There might be a divorce. We could have a bankruptcy. It's all the uh, you know, fun and <laughs> interesting things that your clients haven't told you to get to this point. Point of discovery in litigation can be very important because the, the concept that is looked at by the court is, yes, now, you know, obviously with the lawsuit, we're way down the path where someone is losing money, someone is upset, there's some loss to be had. And point of discovery takes you back to that first time that we knew that there was a problem and that's where the liability generally begins for a real estate agent. And then they look at what happened from that point of discovery coming forward. So let's use an example. Let's say that you've turned in a contract. We give you back the title commitment. And when we look at the title commitment, we see that your contract had John as your seller. But now your commitment comes out and it has John, Dave, and Sam. And John, Dave, and Sam are brothers who have all inherited this property from mom and dad. Now, to this point, you've had all your conversations with John. You've done your listing presentation with John. You've done the drone pictures and put it in MLS, and you've gone under contract with John because John thinks he's the owner of the property. People just don't understand how property passes when somebody dies. Very often, the family has um, you know, gotten together, and the other two brothers have said, we don't want anything to do with this property, and so they think that means John's just the only seller. But from a legal perspective, you now actually don't have a contract anymore because you have three owners in title and only one that has signed your contract. The, the liability and the risk for you as an agent, though, is that we have made all the representations that makes us think we're under contract. You know, we've usually by this point, we've said to the parties, you're under contract. <laughs> um, and so we have to look at the first time we have information that is contrary to that and start to peel it back and decide what to do. Um, you know, the, the gut check reaction is, well, I sure don't want to call the buyer's agent and say, hey, we're out of contract because, you know, in, in today's market, that might <laughs> have a really big implication. But you also, as an agent, don't want to be silent about it. Because if we look at, look at what happens to the buyer if we deal with it right away versus we don't deal with it until we get to closing. 
So there's usually two trains of, of thought that happen when we run into this situation. Um, the, what I'll call the don't version, we notify the parties that there's something missing, you know, we need these two people to join. And typically we'll talk to the seller, we'll talk to the seller's agent and, the, you know, we'll say, okay, good. They all uh, get along. They're all going to show up at closing. It's not a problem. Y'all are going so busy and so fast all the time that we take that answer and we just move on. Fast forward 21 days later and we're at closing and now the brothers are in a fight. <laughs> There's always one brother that thinks it wasn't sold for enough. There's always one brother that didn't like the agent that was chosen and thought it should have been a different agent. And for whatever reason now they're in a fight and they are not going to sign. The buyer of course at this point is going to be homeless, has a full moving truck, probably has kids that aren't gonna get into the school they wanted to, might be fighting a rate lock issue. They've spent money on appraisal and survey and inspections and all kinds of stuff. And so their damages on the day of closing are fairly hefty versus going back to the point of discovery, which is the first time you get the title commitment. If you look at what the buyer's damages are at that point, they're fairly minimal. You know, they actually get all their money back, all their option money and their earnest money because there was no contract. They probably haven't spent a lot of money at this point. And they aren't in that very tense situation where they don't have a place to live, nowhere to go. So I raised that legal concept for you guys, a point of discovery, because up until you get the title commitment, y'all have done everything that you could do as your due diligence to get here. You know, you're not title researchers, you're not escrow officers, you don't have a legal obligation when you're negotiating with the seller to go down and check all the records and make sure that they're the complete owner you can rely on the information that they've given you. But once you get that title commitment, you do have different or extra knowledge that comes up that would say, you know, now you know, so now we need to do something about it. So I don't necessarily think you jump in the middle of it and you call everyone and you say, oh my God, we don't have a contract. I think what you do is you say, you send a message to the other side and say, FYI, I've found out there are two more people in title and I've sent out an amendment to be signed to add them to the contract. Something that says you're working on it, gives them a notification, but doesn't hold that liability piece, basically. Uh, Nicole, I can do a screen share if you let me in. <laughs> Sorry, I was reading uh, comments, questions. <laughs> okay. Um, do you want me to go ahead and ask you a couple of questions right now? Let's see. I you can look at this. Uh, look at the link. Uh, all right. So for damages, is that liability for the buyer's agent, listing agent, seller? Okay. So in that specific example that we're talking about, there's obviously liability for the sellers. And then there's also liability for the listing agent as far as needing to stop and make the disclosure that here's what I'm doing to try to work on it. And there is liability on the buyer's agent as well because the buyer gets a, the buyer's agent gets a copy of the title commitment. And you know, for you guys, once you have a a due diligence report in your possession, you're charged with that knowledge. So you're in the same boat where you are equally on notice. So whenever we get involved in litigation, the, the rights and responsibilities of the, of the parties kind of bifurcate, meaning the buyer and the seller, they're typically the ones that ultimately have the responsibility and the liability to each other. That's a harder sell to quote, win damages than it is How against a city or a title company because we're just, just seen as you know, an industry that has deep pockets. And I don't know, I, we heard, that's what I heard. I think that's Denise I hear. <laughs> kind of notice like a, a battery on one of our um, alarm thing. I just told John, I'm like, what did I just hear? <laughs> hey, Denise. Okay, she must have gotten it. I got her, yeah, sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, so the you know the point here is if you're not already in the habit of looking at the title commitment when it comes out, I really think you should. And it's your first opportunity to figure out if you might have a barrier to closing. When you're looking at these, you should look at vesting, which is on Schedule A number three, and you should always look at Schedule C to figure out you know what has to be cleared. Obviously, we work with your sellers to help get those items cleared, but the time that you're going to know if is a small issue brewing or maybe even a really big issue is right when that commitment comes out. So I think everybody's already in the habit of 
looking at Schedule C, but I don't know that everyone's in the habit of looking at Schedule A. And so I wanna make sure that you guys are doing that part also. All right, next slide. All right, so let's shift a little bit. And I wanna talk about the legal concept of ambiguity because the legal description is really the first place where that shows up for us. So um, a term can be ambiguous when it has more than one meaning. And that can become very important in the legal description in special provisions and a couple of other places. As an example, I like to use the word escrow. So we escrow your contract. We, the whole process of what we do behind the scenes is called escrow. I have an escrow fee that we charge to do all that work. I have escrow officers that work for us. And I also, typically you'll see a buyer set up an escrow account where they're gonna put in their taxes and insurance. Sometimes we escrow money post-closing. So there's six different meanings for one little bitty word that I'm using. What the law says is that if we are arguing about what the meaning of that word means, um, it's the meaning is going to be construed against the drafter of the document. What that means is when we're writing contracts, we have the primary responsibility, whoever's drafting it, to use language that is unequivocally clear. So if I use the term escrow, and I think it means one thing, and Nicole is the seller, and Nicole thinks it means something different, my meaning is going to lose because I drafted the contract, basically. With legal description, I've seen that bite people before, particularly when you are going to sell property that is now being conveyed in a configuration that is different from its original structure. So let's say as the seller, I have 100 acres that I'm trying to sell. Nicole makes an offer and Nicole's offer says 10 acres of this 100 acres. If we don't do the work of putting together field notes, describing those 10 acres with some specificity, and then later, Nicole and I get into an argument about which 10 acres she intended to buy and which 10 acres I intended to sell. I'm going to win because Nicole, it's construed against Nicole's meaning. So that's important for you guys to pay attention to when you've got uh, field notes, acreage transactions, somewhere where we're carving out to create condos. You know, that's become a really big thing in our market where someone will take a a single lot or a small parcel and condo it into two separate units. You have to be really careful about describing that then. We had a case about, geez, I guess about eight years ago. And when the contract came into us, the legal description said lot six. And so we closed lot six, insured lot six. Um, and right after our closing, we found out that the septic to the house was on a portion of the neighboring lot, lot portion of lot seven. Obviously, something like that goes to litigation. And what came out during litigation was a series of arguments from the buyer saying, clearly, I intended to buy that portion where the septic is. You know, it was what you advertised in MLS seller. It's all the negotiations that we talked about. It's all of the emails that we sent, which were later excluded because of the four corners of the document doctrine. And obviously, why would I buy a house that's functionally obsolete, you know? But in that particular instance, the seller ends up winning because when you look at the contract, when you only look at the contract because that's the evidence that's allowed, the contract was written for lot six only. It didn't have the portion of lot seven on it. So we had we had um, four corners of the document doctrine fighting the parties there. We had ambiguity fighting the parties. And if you think about who that's gonna injure in that situation, it's going to injure the buyer who drafted the contract. So you can see why writing language in your contract is so very important that it's unequivocally clear. Um, a lot of you guys have, you know, a very strong leadership team that you can work on and I would work with. And I would say anytime you're getting into writing something that isn't just your standard thing that you're used to doing, if you almost always do residential and now you're getting into some acreage, you want to work with your leadership team to make sure you're putting the right stuff in your contract. If you've never done a condo conversion before, you wanna make sure you're working with them so that you're putting the right stuff in the contract because it feels simple. It always feels simple when you're writing the contract. It always feels really hard when you get into litigation or defending yourselves. So it's worth that little pullback for a minute. All right, um, one of the other things that changed in the, or one of the things that changed in the contract recently is just that we've added some language to say that security systems um, aren't necessarily fixtures. And more importantly, because this was a big issue for a while, 
is that any of the controls that are needed to access things like Nest, doorbells, uh, you know, the thermostats also have to be conveyed with the property. So easy change, but something that helped quite a bit. Next slide, please. All right, um, another concept here is called incorporation by reference. And we talked about it a little bit when we talked about the third party financing addendum. Something that's important for you guys to know is when you're thinking about your contract as a whole, you have to look at the contract as one separate legal document. And then each addendum that you choose to use in your transaction is a separate legal document. And um, the only way that you bring those individual addendums to be a piece of your contract is by incorporating them by reference. So checking the appropriate box in the contract to pull them in. If you think about you're standing in one of our lobbies wanting to escrow your contract, think about having your contract in one hand and all your addendums in the other hand. If the boxes aren't checked in your contract, that's the only legal living document that exists. So you may as well hand us the contract and shred everything else in the rest of your hand because it doesn't exist. Even if you negotiated it, even if all of the terms that you guys talked about beforehand are contained in those addendums, they're not legally incorporated into that contract until you've checked the box. So with third-party financing, that's really, really important. It's important with all your addendums, but I want you to keep that in mind as, as we talk about contracts because those other addendums just flat don't exist if you haven't checked the box to bring them in. Next slide. Leitra, we actually can't see you on video. Is your, is your camera turned on or is there something, is there a setting I can change? Well, that's probably by design. Uh, <laughs> my bad. Leitra, um, yes, before you go on to the next one, can you just clarify something for me? You stated um, if it's the addendums isn't on the contract, they're not a part of the contract. What if you add an addendum on later? Would you need to reference it in the contract? So if you're doing like an amendment later to add something in, you would wanna make sure that you're referencing it in the uh, uh, amendment that you're bringing it in. So you do have to reference it in the original contract or a subsequent signing signed document by the parties. Okay, so when you do add an amendment in, um, you would need to reference that on the contract as well. Yeah, so let's say that you didn't get the third party financing locked up in the first contract and you realized it and now you're trying to fix it. You would do an amendment saying third party financing is now incorporated into the contract and attach that at that point. Yeah, so you can you can cure it with an amendment. If that's the question. Okay, so thank all you. Right. you have to go back. Can I ask a question? Sure. Do you have to go back, and hi, by the way, do you have to go back and have the buyers and sellers initial the original contract and check the box? No, if you're going to incorporate it by way of amendment, them signing the amendment, and then also signing the third-party financing addendum will cure the gap from previously. All right, um, so this is a new paragraph in your contracts, and it's actually a really good time to talk about it because in the last week I've seen three contracts where this was needed and not completed, so it's important for y'all to, to know about this. Um, prior to the current version of the contract, there wasn't really anything that addressed when a property is leased or has a UCC lease on it. Um, we had really good forms for buyer lease back, seller lease back, but nothing for what are we doing if we're selling a property that's investment. So now this paragraph and the corresponding addendums are gonna help you out. First par paragraph deals with a residential lease. So this is your tenant situation. Um, if you'll go to the next slide for me, Nicole. So now you have a new addendum that talks about what happens with the leases. This is very helpful for y'all because this is where the buyers and the sellers get to set out their expectations about what's gonna happen to the tenant that's in the property, the deposits, all of the, the money piece and more importantly, getting somebody out or not of the property. So um, what this does is it puts a responsibility if you check box A in there on the seller to make sure not only that their lease is terminated, but also that their tenants are out. Doesn't happen too often. But sometimes we'll have a closing where we're transferring property between investors and the tenants haven't moved out and they should. <laughs> When you do your walkthrough on that day as a buyer and you realize that they're still in the property, this gives you the out to say, you know, wait, part of the negotiated requirements was that they be out of the property and they're not. Instead of just inheriting a property where now you have a problem with the tenant that won't get out. So super helpful. Also tells us um, on the title side, 
that we are to collect the deposits between the parties, which is helpful because it's always made me really nervous when the seller brings a check for the deposit and gives it to the buyer at closing. You know, sometimes those checks don't clear. <laughs> so it just makes it helpful for us to have all of the money on the settlement statement. You'll go backwards, Nicole, for me. All right, the next thing that comes up is fixture leases. And this is something that's happened three times recently for us. So fixture items are things that are attached to the property generally after the home is created. So I, I call them sort of an aftermarket add-on. These are your water softeners, solar panels, propane tanks, sometimes security systems. And the reason that these are a separate component to the real estate that's being conveyed is because oftentimes there's a debt associated with acquiring these items. And that debt isn't always recorded in the real property records. So it's not like going out and getting a mortgage and we have the deed of trust that's filed on title. Some of these fixture lease companies are really good about filing what's called a UCC. Um, the UCC is sort of the lien instrument for this, but about half of them aren't. And so what has happened to us before is we will get into closing and at the closing table, all of my escrow officers have an affidavit of debts and liens that they sign. And we're, go we're sitting there, we're going through closing. We say to the seller, okay, so we're paying off the Wells Fargo home mortgage. Is there any other item that you're paying on that's associated with this house? And at that point, they'll say, oh yeah, well, I owe solar panels. I owe a, um, a water softener. And that stops your transaction, which is entirely the wrong time to be stopping your transaction. Once we find out there's a debt owed, we have to stop the closing, go and get a payoff statement, get that on our settlement statement, reorganize everything. And you know those UCC lenders, they're not just sitting around waiting for my phone call. So sometimes it can take a couple of days. And if it takes a couple of days to get the payoff, we've now run out of contract because you know we're usually closing on the day that's in the contract. So using this addendum and asking the question of your sellers prior to getting under contract is a big help to stop all of that mess that has been happening over you know, the last decade or so. So Nicole, if you'll go two more for me to that addendum, please. So the addendum has a couple of options. Um, in the addendum, first you have the option of marking which item it is that we're talking about. And then you decide either the buyer is gonna assume the note for those payments, which is your option one there, or the seller's gonna have to remove the item and or, and or have it completely paid for. So you have a couple different options of what can happen and you're allowed to define them by contract instead of getting to the closing table and all of a sudden it's everyone's hair on fire and people start arguing about who's supposed to pay for what. Also, you're required to give a copy of that lease if the buyer is gonna assume it to the buyer, which tells them all the things that they need to know about the terms of the note. So this was intended to fill the gaps of all the unknown that comes from a UCC. The last item in that paragraph on the leases deals with natural resource leases. Those are your oil and gas. In a standard residential transaction, you shouldn't have any of these probably. Um, it does not require your seller to notify about all natural gas leases. It's only the ones that they've incurred since they own the property. So that's a simple question to ask your seller. So now you'll know if the property is leased by a tenant. You may not know about the UCC leases. And so this is where when you see a water softener or solar panels on the property, you're gonna to have to ask your client a little bit more detail. Are, are they paid for? Are you still paying them? And I see a question. If the sellers owe on a solar panel or something of that nature, how is that documented in the contract when submitting the offer? Good question. So you guys on the sales side wanna ask your client, you know, your solar panels that are installed, are, are they paid for or are you still paying on them? And if they say that they're still paying on them, when you do the MLS listing, you want to put a note in there that says UCC or solar panel lease. I would include the terms of what they are because you want to start negotiating that right out of the gate. And your negotiation is, is the buyer going to assume and take over the payments? And if they do that, um, there's a process that we have to go through as the title company to go to that UCC lender. They have this big packet of documents that have to sign. Sometimes the buyer will have to fill out an application. So it's a little bit bigger than just saying, okay, you take over the payments. <laughs> or the other option is they're going to be removed, which no one's going to go out and remove the solar panels. <laughs> or they're going to convey, but the seller has to pay for them in full. 
So that can end up being a fairly big piece of the negotiation. And I wouldn't want you guys just to speed through that part thinking it can be worked out because if you don't negotiate it in the beginning, at the end, someone's gonna be really disappointed. And, and anytime the buyers and sellers get mad, they point all the fingers at every professional in the transaction. So that's also why I'm bringing it up a little heavier than I normally would because I've seen three deals fall apart recently because we've gotten to closing and you know we've seen the UCC and all of a sudden it's like the first time it's coming up, which is not good. Um, UCC stands for Uniform Commercial Code and that's just the different version of the deed of trust you know, that's not tied to the property. All right, next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about the change um, in the option money. Obviously, you guys already know about this because you've been doing it since April, but one of the big changes in the contract now has provided for the option money to come to the title company instead of going to the seller. Hopefully, you guys are finding that that's a really big help now. It was very confusing for customers when they had to write two different checks to two different people that went two different places. They never really got it right. Um, and for our folks, this has been a really big help as well. Um, your clients can write one check. They can use Zocom, which is the mobile app to deposit it. And then they write their check payable to us. When we get those checks in, we hold them in our file. We had a lot of confusion when this first converted over where agents were thinking that we needed to write the option check to the seller to complete the process. Um, and we can certainly do that upon request. But what we're finding is that cutting the checks um, is kind of creating a bit of a problem when we get to closing. So when we cut a check from our escrow account during the escrow process, so there's two versions of escrow, <laughs> um, lenders want us to source every piece of money that we disperse from our file. So what is happening is the seller will ask for the option check. And after we've had it for 10 days, then we can cut that check to them. So now we're 10 days into contract. We cut the option check, we get it to the seller, they drive around with it in their car for three days and they don't actually deposit it. <laughs> and so now we're getting close to closing and before the buyer's lender will give the buyer credit for that option money, they wanna see that it's cleared. And so the seller, you know, our check isn't showing that it's cleared. And so we're kind of running into some issues with that. So my advice to you guys would be, let us just keep the money. And then of course, if it cancels, we can cut you the check, assuming 10 days has passed or we can cut it to the seller. And if it closes, we just pass it through on the settlement statement. So it's messier to try to cut a check. So advice to you guys on that. And I see one chat question. Um, okay. So if the buyer pulls out before the, all right, if sellers ask title to hold money in escrow, who does the buyer make the check out to? Um, the buyer makes all the checks out to the title company. So they can write one check, they can write two, but it's all made payable to us. And if the buyer pulls out before the three days, do they still need to pay the option? This has been really shady. <laughs> um, so the intent of the contract is not to just have a free day, three day period and then not write those checks. So I would not advise your client to hold back for that reason. They really should be writing the checks because that's the purpose of the contract. Now, effectively, I do see people holding on until the last day and canceling and never delivering checks. Um, someone doing that needs to be the principal. It really shouldn't be you guys involved in the transaction because it's definitely not the intent of that paragraph. Next slide, please. Still talking about option money. So your termination paragraph has moved up now. Um, something to note, and this has happened quite a bit lately, the five o'clock timeline is local time. So for those of you that are working with clients that are out of state, um, particularly people in California, they need to cancel by three o'clock our time, not five o'clock their time. Um, and that's been something we've gotten a, a fair amount of cancellations that, you know, it would work if it was 5 p.m. California time, but it's not, it's Texas time. So just keep that in mind. Uh, next slide, please. All right, let's shift and talk about title policy mistakes. Um, so when we're dealing with paragraph six of the contract, paragraph six, eight is one teeny, teeny little bitty piece of the contract that if we don't handle it properly at the beginning or through closing can actually end up creating a lot of liability for the agents. And so I like to talk about what this means so that you guys understand it. Um, this is also one of those pieces in the contract where 
your client's not really directing you which option to check because they're never going to understand this, just never, <laughs> um, until they need the coverage. So they're relying on you and their fiduciary relationship with you to guide them in this process. So paragraph 68 is um, what we call survey deletion. We also call it area and boundary. And we might call it survey coverage because you know we like to confuse people. <laughs> what we're talking about is the, def the obligation of a title company to defend the boundary lines of your client's property. So when you get a title commitment and it has all those schedules, it has A, B, C, and D. Um, D is only important to, to uh, the states. Don't worry about that. Schedule A of a commitment says what we're going to insure. Schedule C of the commitment says what we have to clear to get to closing. And Schedule B is a really important piece of the commitment that says um, these are the items that are not going to be covered in your title policy. One of those exceptions, they're called Schedule B exceptions, basically says that when it comes to the location of or the obligation to defend the boundary lines of the property, there is no coverage. And that's very counter to what buyers think when they're getting a title policy. You guys have all been in a situation before where you're standing with your client in front of the house and you're looking at it and they ask you that question of, is that my fence or is that the neighbor's? The question that they're asking you really is, how much do I own? That's really important to people. And your standard title policy that's issued from every single closing doesn't offer any coverage for that. The only way your client gets coverage or puts an obligation on us to defend the location is by getting the survey deletion which means for you guys, that means checking 6A82. So where it says will be amended to read shortages in area, that's a bunch of um, you know, legal jargon for saying, put the obligation on the title company to defend the boundary lines of the property. So it's one of those things that's a very small check mark in the contract, but can be really important later. So let's look at some examples of how that can be important. Next slide. Will you switch for me, Nicole? Thank you. All right, so this is what happens in the title policy when you say that it will be amended. Every title um, commitment that comes out is going to say that we don't cover discrepancies with the boundary lines. We don't cover if there's a conflict. Um, we don't cover shortages in area. What that means is if one surveyor says it's 0.45 of an acre and another one says 0.47, that's not covered. That'll never be covered. Um, we don't cover if there's an encroachment, meaning something from a neighboring lot into our lot. We also don't cover protrusions, which is something from our lot in a neighbor's lot. And we don't cover overlapping improvements. So these are all things that could offend a boundary line of a property. When your client gets the coverage, which means we have to have a survey and they have to pay the premium, we take out all of those exceptions, basically meaning we do give coverage for those items minus the shortages in area. So we're in a spot now where if your client post-closing has a problem with one of these issues, they file a claim under the title policy, and then we work with them to resolve the issue. Um, otherwise, what happens is if your client ends up with a problem related to the boundary, they're, they're always going to call title. They're going to say, I have a problem, and we're going to look at their commitment and see that they didn't get the coverage, which means they don't have any protection from us. Who do you think the next phone calls to? Always the agent, right? It's always the one that sold them the property. So now they're in a position where whatever it takes to resolve that problem, they have to pay for out of their own pocket. So every time they talk to a lawyer, most of us bill in six or eight minute increments. So every six or eight minutes, they're having to reach into their pocket, pull out their checkbook and pay for that assistance instead of having the title policy pay for it. So one of the questions I see is that you're told boundary coverage is relatively inexpensive. It is very inexpensive. So on a residential piece of property, it's 5% of the owner's title policy. So let's say that's a $500,000 property and you're probably, your client's gonna pay about $150. So for $150, they cover themselves for, for these issues or they have to go pay someone in six or eight minute increments <laughs> to litigate the issue for them or mediate the issue, whatever the resolution is. So if you think about, you know, most attorney billable hours right now are four to $500 an hour for one portion of that, they can cover themselves or they can just pay for it every time. All right, how would that coverage be handled if the T47 wasn't notarized and therefore wasn't a true affidavit? Well, so good question, Alice. 
Um, when we get to closing, A, that shouldn't happen with us because we get a separate T47 at the time of closing because I wanna lock up our sellers on that as well. Um, but if there wasn't a true affidavit done and your title company closed and said they were gonna provide the coverage, they would still be obligated to provide the coverage. So it's not an excuse for us to say, if we miss the um, affidavit, we can't provide it. That liability would rest on us. So let's look at some examples of where this can help. Next slide. All right, so I am a better lawyer than I am an artist, so forgive my drawings, but <laughs> I want you to look at these. First is two independent surveys. So let's say when this survey comes in, the house on the left is the survey that we have. And it's a five acre residential tract of land, home in the middle. And when we're looking at it, we see that along the interior lot, um, there's a fence. And the fence is about five feet off of what the property line is showing on the survey. So something that's that far off the property line raises a bit of a red flag for us on the escrow side. And so we need to start looking at the survey. <laughs> I wasn't gonna say that, Russ. <laughs> um, when we're looking at the survey and we see that the fence is off the property line that far, from a title perspective, I'm now concerned that somebody else thinks they claim up to that fence. And so um, for us, we start looking at that and we say, well, wait a minute, that's a problem. We need to wrestle that out before closing. But let's pretend that that made it through closing. Maybe we got a survey where the fence wasn't even showing because we do use a bunch of existing surveys. Um, and so we get far enough you know, into the transaction, we close it and now your buyer's dealing with the situation. Now your buyer wants to put in a pool and so they require a new survey and the new survey shows that the fence is inside the property line. Um, then if we look at you know, the neighbor, the neighbor and your buyer are now in a situation where someone is going to say they own that piece of property and someone's gonna lose someone is going to have a monetary impact from this issue. So the area that I have in conflict there, particularly if it's a five acre tract of land, that's a lot of value for somebody to be losing. So if your client made it all the way through closing and they elected that they were not going to get this coverage, as soon as they start to realize that there's a problem, they're reaching into their pocket, they're having to pay to, to do the defense of it. Or if your client got the coverage, they make a phone call to us we turn it in as a claim, and then claims processing has to handle all of these things. So it really is a way to lift liability off of you guys as agents, because you're not going to know if this situation is going to happen. You guys are not surveyors. You're not going out to the property and shooting all the diagonals and making sure that the pins are in the right place. And by saying to your client they should get the coverage, it removes that liability from y'all and shifts it to them. If instead your client gets all the way through closing and this happens and they say, I don't want to pay the $150, I have a disclosure that they sign that tells them all this horrible stuff that could happen and they sign the disclosure. And then we call it informed consent that completely removes the liability from you guys. And it now is the buyer's decision because you get into situations where your buyers make bad decisions that negatively affect them monetarily, but it's shifted the burden from you to them. So I would say as a standard practice, you always want to say that they are going to get the coverage um, so that you're not the one saying they're not going to get it. And I think it's important to get it on new surveys too. Um, we've had situations before where, particularly with new builds, where it's the same seller, same builder, same title company, all down the lot in a big subdivision. Um, you'll see it maybe once a year or so where all the houses are built just a teeny tiny bit too far into the neighboring lot. But we got a new survey because they shot all the surveys at one time um, and now your client has a problem. So I think it's important every time that you suggest they get it and then they can always decline. All right, um, do you need a new survey if you put in a fence or if your neighbor puts in a boundary fence? Um, you know, it doesn't hurt. And I know people, I know your sellers especially don't wanna spend money on new surveys, um, particularly now, when we have such tight negotiations, no one you know, wants to put any sort of wrench in the process, but having a new survey when something has changed is really important because it's gonna actually show you where the stuff is. Um, you know, If it's a, a teeny little fence and it's a wire fence or something like that, it's probably not that big of a deal, but we've seen issues um, where someone has put a giant concrete fence in the wrong place and that's a $30,000 thing to fix. 
So the bigger the item, <laughs> my standard is can I send David Tandy out on a Saturday to rip it up? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, but, you know, the bigger the item, the more money someone's going to spend, the more you want to make sure it's in the right place. And, you know, with surveys, I probably get, so in our company, when escrow has a question about can we accept a survey or do we need a new survey, they send it to me to review. And I probably get 30 a day that we look at. Um, the question is always, do we have to have a new survey? And, you know, if it's a really big lot and somebody put a little bitty pool in the back and I can get a copy of the pool plans with all the dimensions so that I feel okay about the location of the pool, then I'll probably take it. But if it's a, you know, small lot and the pool looks like it takes up the whole backyard, I'm probably going to require another one. And that's definitely not because we want to throw a, a wrench in your transaction, but it's because I want all of us in the transaction to be protected and make sure that everything's in the right place. Because if, if that goes south, someone on this call is going to end up putting some money up for it. And I just don't like that. All right, next slide, please. All right, um, brief note about the title commitment because I've talked for a long time and I wanna cover everything. <laughs> um, when you get the title commitment, um, when we send one out, we hyperlink all of the documents that affect the transaction. And that's important for you guys. So when the title commitment comes out, especially on the buyer side, I really love to see you guys send an email to your buyer that says, hey, this is one of those due diligence reports we talked about, or this is an important report that affects your ownership in the property. Um, and make sure you've reviewed it, period. You don't have to go into everything else. The reason it's important that we hyperlink and give copies of all the documents that affect the transaction is because your buyers ask you very weird things that are very important to them, like, can I paint the front door blue? Can I put in a mother-in-law unit? Can I you know, do whatever I want with the property? And what they're getting to is what are the restrictions? What are the limitations on the property? And I never want you guys to be the authority on that. I don't ever want you to say yes or no. <laughs> what I want you to say is you get a copy of all the documents that affect your interest in the property. It's called the title commitment. That's where you'll find that information. If uh, a company hyperlinks it, it's great because you have all the documents. If you're working with a company that does not hyperlink, you need to make sure that they're sending copies of all of those documents to your client because that's how you shift the responsibility to your buyer and get it off of you guys. So that's what I want you to do. Um, all right, question, going back to the survey, what if title approves only one signature on the T47? Um, so we get two different T47s during the transaction. We get the initial one that comes in that really isn't our baby, so we don't police that one. But on the final one, owner that we're getting signed. And that's a question that we get a lot is, does that first affidavit, um, does it have to be signed by everybody? Does it have to be notarized to satisfy the contract? I believe it does. But for us, we're going to get a final one at closing that locks it up for us. Um, next question is, if there is a case where the neighbor did put a fence past the survey line, is it an option for that party to purchase the small piece of land they are encroaching on and change the survey rather than moving the fence? can't buy it. The long answer though is we have to make sure when we're doing that, we're not creating an illegal lot status if you're in a municipality. So if you're in the city of Austin and you carve out a little piece to fix that situation, that can actually have really major implications down the line. Um, we've seen it before where that exact situation happened. There was this teeny tiny little strip that needed to be purchased so that the next door neighbor could build the size home that they wanted. And so they just did field notes and bought that strip. And now the person that sold the property that has the remainder of that other lot, the city won't issue a permit to them do what they want to do with it because now it's an illegal lot status. And now they're also fining them and that fines $25,000. So I would not do that without some legal advice <laughs> um, and you know, ostensibly going through a title company. Next slide, please. Um, all right, just a reminder, one new thing in the contracts is about smart devices. Um, so your clients need to write down passwords, access codes, um, anything that they need that the buyer needs to be able to access stuff. So think about if I'm moving into your home and I can't access the thermostat, that's going to be a problem. So now in all the things y'all are really great about writing out where the mailbox is and how to get a pool key, that needs to be added to the list. <laughs> and then B2 kind of makes me chuckle. When your sellers sell the home, they should remove the access from their 
phones to see cameras in the house, the doorbell, stuff like that. They shouldn't be looking back at who's delivering Amazon at their old home. So next slide. All right, um, special provisions. So we talked about ambiguity earlier. I really, really hate to see you guys write too much in special provisions um, because when you write something in there, you're effectively writing it with your own checkbook. You know, um, there's no real bright line test that says, write this and it's okay and don't write that, it's always bad. There's a couple of things like Trek has said, never write an escalation clause in there, that's clear. Um, but because this is open to ambiguity, if it doesn't work out right, the liability or the finger pointing is always going to be back at the real estate agents involved. So be really careful with what you write in here. You know, things like house to be professionally clean. You're never going to make it through your career without paying to have a house free clean. That's a smaller stuff. You don't want to write in big ticket items that are very expensive. And something I'm seeing right now is we do have a lot of out-of-state purchasers that are buying and they want us to write really crazy stuff in here because that's what they see in their market. It's appropriate for you guys to say that's not something that's an industry standard for us. But if you have somebody that is really, really pushing you, have them write the language and send it to you and then you put it in. And that way you've got your whole email chain to say, here's you know, why I put this in. And certainly check with your team leads before you get too far into it. Um, sometimes you might just need to say no, but you just don't want to be the one that's creating stuff. We see a lot of very verbose language in here, which is always bad. Um, I laughed because I saw one one time that said seller to repaint front of house. And I'm thinking no, like lime greens on sale at Home Depot, that's what I'm picking. So you just want to be really careful about what you're putting in there. Um, and then paragraph 12, a, B there, we still have a lot of confusion about how much the seller is going to contribute under this paragraph. Many people think the dollar amount that you write in there is the exact dollar amount that the seller is going to pay. And that happens if and only if the buyer has costs up to that number. So when we get into writing the bigger ticket numbers in here, sometimes you'll see $15,000. Your seller, your buyer's probably not going to have $15,000 worth of costs unless you have a big contract. And so people get upset where the seller is now only going to contribute 8,000 and the buyer wants the check for the difference. And that's not what this paragraph says. So next slide, please. Um, I always like to put a little notice out there. So when we do have a contract that is going south and we think we're going to be involved in litigation, sometimes what happens is your parties have shifted from um, a logical approach to this into an emotional approach and you are they're just yelling at you and they're mad about something and you're kind of struggling with what to say about how you might help them get less mad one of the things that is important for y'all to know is when there's a dispute from the contract every single track contract that the parties sign everyone has already agreed to go to mediation before they file a lawsuit so if you have that client that's saying that's it i'll just sue everybody involved I think it's okay for you to say, you know, I'm not an attorney, but I do know that the contract would require that everybody go to mediation. And I would hate to see you go out and spend a bunch of money filing a lawsuit and not tell you that. You know, you're not telling them what to do. You're not giving them legal advice, but you're definitely hoping to uh, quash some of their frustration. And then the other thing that is appropriate for you to raise if they really are bringing up the issue is typically when we're involved in litigation, I'm responsible for my costs and you're responsible for your costs, attorney's fees and all that stuff. And that's just kind of how all litigation in Texas works, except for track contracts and a couple other things. With a track contract, we have contractually agreed that if we end up in a dispute, first we'll go to mediation. Um, and then second, the attorney's fees that come from mediation or from a lawsuit are going to be the responsibility of the party that loses. So if your person is not really in the right and they're just mad and they're going to sue everybody, I think it's appropriate for you guys to say, I understand you're frustrated. I wouldn't feel good about not making sure that you understand if we fight, you know, if you file a lawsuit and you lose, you pay for everybody's fees. You're not going to use that very often, but I do think it's really good to have in your brain just how it really functions in reality. Next slide, please. Um, so the escrow paragraph near and dear to my heart, because what it says is that a contract, I mean, we're not necessarily a party to your contract. Um, what that means is that we aren't in a position to make decisions or give opinions and advice about what has to happen in the contract. Um, and, and sometimes we end up in a situation where 
you know, the buyer's really upset and they want us to tell them what to do. And we just can't do that basically. But I do want you guys to know about paragraph 18C because this is helpful probably once or twice a month really right now. Let's say that you have a situation where your contract is canceling and your client is entitled to the earnest money back, but for whatever reason, we're just not getting the release of earnest money form signed. And we send it out and there's just zero response on the other side of the parties. Paragraph 18C comes in and says that your client can make a demand for the earnest money. And when that demand is made, that starts a 15 day clock. And the 15 days, once it passes, if we don't get an objection back, we're allowed per contract to release the money. So this is a great way for you to feel like the hero for your client because they're getting frustrated, they want their money. Um, and you can say, let's do the demand and then title will release it. Now, the key is, and this is sometimes that makes us not able to use the demand at all, is when your client sends the demand um, and the demand can be super simple. It can say, dear Latra, I demand my earnest money on this property. Um, I send it out. I have to send it to the address that is in paragraph 21 of the contract. Well, if you'll go to the next slide for me. Um, even though I feel like I've taught this class 5,000 times for 15 years, <laughs> paragraph 21 of the contract is very, very frequently blank. <laughs> so for you guys as agents, I don't want you in a spot where we now need to rely on this paragraph and it just flat hasn't been filled in because that pushes the liability back to y'all. You know, that's when your clients say, I wanna make a demand and we say, we can't honor one because it's not filled in. And they turn and look at you and say, why isn't it filled in? <laughs> so be very cautious about that. You know, even on the buyer's side, I think what happens most of the time is you're writing up the contract, you fill in the information for your client and then it feels like the seller's agent should fill in the seller's contact information. You know, that's their side of the contract. And that is where you can get set up, to not have anything filled in for the seller at all. So is I would always say you want something in there, um, even if it's the property address, because we could do a delivery to the property address. You just don't want it blank. Do we have to do a property address or can it be an email? You can do an email. So don't. Don't just do a phone number because I can't deliver to a phone number, <laughs> but you can do any singular item there. So you can do email, fax, or physical address. You don't have to do And does that have to be certified mail or does that just be done through the title company? We would do it certified mail just to make sure that we could document it for, for us. Yeah. But if it's email, how do we do it via email? Does it, do we just so if it's email a, to the title? Yeah. It's demand. So your client sends the demand to me, dear Latra, I demand the earnest money. And then I forward it to the email address and say, please see below, here's the demand. If we don't hear from you in 15 days, we will release the money. Awesome. Yeah, it's good to know. You know, Hopefully you don't have to use it very often, but um, it definitely comes up probably once or twice a month, really. Next slide, please. Um, another thing um, that is a big piece of, of litigation in Texas are seller disclosure issues. And you guys kind of end up in this really uncomfortable position with your clients because what will happen is at some point during the listing presentation, they'll tell you about something that's kind of a gray area as far as disclosure is concerned. You know, it's something that may not necessarily rise to the level of being materially affecting the property so that you have the legal obligation to disclose, but it's in that window and it's just kind of yucky. And your sellers oftentimes think that if we get through closing and that issue doesn't arise, then it's going to be the buyer's responsibility to deal with. What paragraph 19 says is that all the representations that are made through closing survive closing, meaning that um, if it's not just skating through and putting a Band-Aid on something that needs to be repaired, that representation is going to follow them and it follows them for a minimum of a four-year limitations period. So how you use this, if you have a client that is having something they probably should disclose and they don't want to, use this to talk about, to say, I just want you to know that if we get through closing and it comes up, you're not just you know, moving on down the line. There is liability that can follow. Second thing here is the federal tax requirements. So when we have a, a person that is a foreign person, not a U.S. citizen selling property, typically there is an amount of money, either 10% or 15% of the sales price, not their gain, that has to go to the IRS. And when we're mid-transaction finding this out, your sellers are never happy about that. <laughs> like never. I've never called a person to say, we're going to have to hold 15% of your sales price and send it to the IRS and have them say yay. <laughs> so part of your listing presentation, if it's not already part of it, 
is to ask the questions anytime you have a red flag or you think someone may not be a U.S. citizen because you want to start talking to them about the withholding at that point. There are some exceptions. Um, and when you have a foreign person, you can call me and I can tell you what all the exceptions are. Um, there's also something they can do where they go to the IRS before the transaction happens to get approval to not withhold. But working with the IRS is not a fast process. <laughs> and so you want to make sure you've allotted enough time or set reasonable expectations. Typically what happens when we're mid-transaction and we're talking about it, y'all have already done a net sheet and that net sheet is going to be wildly different from what they're actually going to get at closing. And it's always a very negative surprise. So just kind of know about that um, and then we can talk about it. Um, question I see is, does this apply to legal aliens? If someone has a green card, it's not applicable. So we would not have to withhold in that, that um, situation. Next slide, please. Um, going back to paragraph 21 real quick, there's a question that says, where do you get the seller's information? Um, if you don't have it from MLS, I suggest that you put the property address in there because that way you have something that you could put in there and we could do a delivery. Or if you're already going back and forth with negotiations about with the listing agent, you could say, I'd like to put your client's information in there. And, you know, 10 years ago, it was really hard for people to find people on the internet. And I completely understood why we wouldn't want to put buyer and seller information in here because we just didn't want them connecting. But now they connect through TikTok. So it's really not even that hard to find everyone. So that argument doesn't really work as much anymore. Next question is, are we required to put client info in or can we put ours to safeguard clients? Good question. Um, I don't like to see you guys put your own information in here. Um, if you're worried about the clients talking to each other, I think you have a different conversation with your client, which is to say, look, if you're having any conversation with the other side of the transaction, that's really gonna disadvantage you. It really should all run through me. That's a better conversation because if you put your information in there, you're actually making yourself legally responsible for all of the due diligence and all of the communication that comes in, which means you don't get to travel, <laughs> you know, you, do, you don't ever get to have a moment off. And we have had situations before where an agent has written their information into the buyer's information. We've sent out the title commitment, we've sent out the survey, that starts the time clock for title commitment review and possible cancellation under the option period. The agent was on vacation, the option period um, and the objections period passed. And now if the buyer wants to cancel, they're gonna lose their earnest money. So you don't wanna put yourself in the middle of that situation. All right, keep going. I think it's also important for agents to realize that, you know, probably one of the reasons this section doesn't get filled out is because if you're sending the contract through DocuSign, you have to make sure that you submit this as um, a tagged field for the other party to fill out their client's information too. Excellent, excellent point, yes. Um, and then one of the questions from Jennifer is, can we just send this directly to title? Do, do you mean your client's information? Um, if you mean, yeah, so if you mean, can we just give the client's information to title, please give it to us because we definitely need it also. But if it's not on the contract, it's not going to give your client the ability to terminate the contract or do a demand. So you would not be able to use that feature. Um, and yes, Russ, IRS efficiency is definitely a mess right now. Um, even though everybody is working from home, it seems like they have a third of the people working. <laughs> um, working with the IRS right now is a super, super long process. All right, paragraph 22. So um, we've added two new options for the addendums. This goes back to that incorporation by reference that we talked about in the beginning. And that's why it's so important. If you don't check this box, your addendum is legally not a part of your contract. Next slide, please. Um, <laughs> effective date of the contract is probably blank as often as paragraph 21 is, which makes it really, really hard for anyone to calculate what your cancellation contingencies might be. So you definitely want to make sure that you're getting that filled in. Um, you know, I understand you don't put it on the very first DocuSign that you're sending over because you're probably not going to have it all locked up in one day to sign. Um, but when, at least as a, at a minimum, when we send the contract back out and we're receiving it, we have a blurb that we'll put in there that says, everyone, please know your effective date is blank. But very few people ever write us back and say, oh, we should fix that and it's blank. So fast forward to now someone's trying to terminate. I'm looking at the contract and they're asking me if we can release earnest money. And I have to say no, because I don't have any idea what the date of the effective date really was. So make sure you're filling that in. Next slide. 
Um, now we receive the option money. So um, that's a really good thing. Hopefully that saves you guys a whole lot of time running around trying to sign that little page and taking care of that. Next slide. All right, let's talk about the HOA addendum. So um, there's been a monetary change with the way that HOA finance pieces are handled. The old language separated out the resale certificate and that's still separate. And then it said outside of the resale certificate, now we're gonna separate out deposits and reserves and those items are gonna be buyer items. And then everything else is going to go into this bucket where we apply the language that you've put in paragraph C. So if you said the buyer's gonna pay 150 bucks, everything that's left over in the bucket, they pay a portion of that, everything else is seller cost. The new language gets rid of that second bucket review. And so now the new language of the addendum basically says that the resale certificate is a separate fee that's negotiated. And then everything else, including deposits and reserves, goes into this paragraph. So we've seen over the past couple of months, people still sticking with the number that they've been using. So buyer pays $150. And then that means that the seller is paying the lion's share of deposits, reserves, and all the other fees that historically have been buyer fees. And that's been a surprise because obviously when you guys are working at net sheets on the seller side, you're not accustomed to putting in deposits and reserves as a seller item. But if you take a contract where the dollar amount is still lower you know, than, than it would be now, your seller's gonna pay a lot of that. So that's definitely been one of those unpleasant surprises as we get through closing um, where people weren't aware of this change. So just want you to know. And no, Tom, it's not longer than an hour. I'm just wrapping it up because I talked too long. <laughs> um, all right, Russ, what's the best way to figure out how much all these fees are and where working capital and stuff like that applies? Good question. Um, so if you ask any of our escrow teams in a subdivision that we're in very often, they'll know what they are. A lot of times we look for a file that we've recently closed um, and we can tell you, oh, you know, Steiner Ranch has two or three HOAs, depending on where you are. We can help you with all that stuff. Um, and your seller should know too. <laughs> Um, financing paragraph. Um, the one thing I want you guys to really understand about how this operates um, is this is a cancellation contingency that relies on notice. So when we get into a situation where a client is trying to cancel through a third party financing addendum, I have a lot of sellers that will say, oh, you can't cancel yet because you didn't apply with my guy or, oh, you can't cancel yet because I need to get a copy of the denial letter. And that's not really how it functions. How it functions is you check a box on the notice of termination and send it in the right amount of time. So there's a lot of confusion that, that comes from that piece. Next slide, please. All right, let's talk about a new disclosure that's coming out for public improvement districts. Um, this is sort of a su surprise change that's coming. Um, the legislature changed the law to say that when a property is in a PID, which is public improvement district, um, there's now a disclosure that's required from the seller to the buyer. The buyer needs to sign it. And that disclosure needs to be done at or before contract execution. So the process is very similar to the MUD notices that you guys are already doing. It's just a separate form. Um, and it, you know, it's new because you haven't been doing, you're not used to doing this. Um, it also applies to commercial properties and condos, which have always kind of been excluded. So that's new as well. And if the buyer doesn't get it, it's a right for them to terminate the contract. So it's one more out for them. Um, and of course they could actually file a lawsuit against the seller for monetary damages, but you know, they'd have to pay, <laughs> they'd have to pay money to do that. But really the big implication is that your buyer can cancel under it. Trek met in sort of an emergency session and they've created an addendum. It should be ready for you guys by the end of the month to use it. Um, and then they also had to make some minor modifications to the contract um, to provide for this. So those will be available by the end of the month. Um, one of the things that is important is we'll also get a final version at closing or required to, um, but that also locks up because if we get the final version signed at closing, that removes the ability to have the lawsuit. So it's not like the buyer could just not get the disclosure until closing and then still maintain the right to sue. Once we get the one at closing, that kind of wraps that up. Next slide, please. So this is the addendum that Trek is in the process of getting finalized. Um, if you look at it, there's actually some information in there that you guys probably might not know. It's specifically gonna ask you which code number to fill in. Um, if you'll go to the next slide for me. Um, maybe go back one. 
one more. All right, maybe go forward. <laughs> uh, all right, let's, look, let's, let's go back one more. There you go. All right, so here's how you're gonna know if your property's in a PID. First of all, your sellers should know. So we've had a lot of conversations um, as this comes up. And there are some PIDs that have been around, like Bunton Creek, Creek has one. Um, you guys may not know because you don't own the property, but your sellers are going to know because they've been assessed a tax, they've been paying a tax, and these don't just come up overnight and nobody knows about them. There's a notice that happens, they're filed in the real property records, so it's a question that you're going to ask your clients. Um, we'll also see it on the tax certificate. Of course, by the time we get it, your contract's already signed, um, but it's something that, you know, your title company will know and your seller will also know. Also, after September 1st, these PIDs, they have to do an update periodically. Um, and when they do the update, uh, they have to file something in the real property records. So it's more additional information in the real property records we'll be able to find. You should also be able to look at it in MLS. So if you find a property very close to your seller's home, you should be able to look at the jurisdictional information and it will show it. Basically a PID is a separate taxing authority that's created by the city or the county. And they create it for relatively temporary infrastructure changes. Temporary with infrastructure might be a couple of years, but it's road maintenance, it's moving utilities, it's things where they need to collect some money now or over a series of years, but it's not gonna continue forever once that project's done. So your clients will know about this stuff. And um, I did some digging around yesterday like Leander has a good PID website. So the county that you're in or the municipality that you're in will have a really good search for you also. And PJ is just giving you guys a really good link in there too. So it takes a little bit of extra research, but I think right now it feels like this big unknown, how are we gonna possibly know? And as you start to dig through your property specifics, it'll come up pretty easily. Next slide. As you're filling this stuff in, so it's going to ask you for information that needs to go into the form. And one of the things that agents have been most concerned about is how do I know which subchapter this PID was created under? Because you have to actually fill that in on the form. And the answer for you guys, unless you're doing something in Bear County, you're always going to put 372 in. There are only three PIDs that have been created under 382, and they're all in Bear County. So you guys will always do 372 otherwise. All right, any other questions? Any questions I didn't answer? Sorry, I took you guys over time. Let's see. All right, one question is, are PIDs mostly for new developments or can they be in older neighborhoods as well? Um, they're both, so they are popular in a new development. We do have several that I've seen um, come up where it's old roads that need to be done and that's the Bunton Creek exa example. So it can be old also, but you know, again, these aren't just created overnight. So your clients are going to have notices that they get in the mail. The HOA will probably be all a Twitter about the conversation too. So it's not going to be a surprise to the owner of the property. Yeah. Um, all right. So I was on a Zoom with my broker about this on Monday and actually sellers may not know that they're part of the PID. Cimarron Hills is a great example if the homeowner paid it all off before they sell. Well, that's also true. Um, so when we get to closing, each PID kind of functions differently. Um, the, what happens when the PID is getting created is there's a document that says, hey, we're recording this in the real property records because one is coming. And we don't know what it is yet, but we think it's gonna be about this dollar amount. <laughs> then there's one that's filed that says, okay, we figured out what it's going to be and it's gonna be this dollar amount. And then there's another one that gets filed that says, Here's the charge for what it's going to be for this individual lot. And it has to be paid back immediately over time, you know, within a five-year period and that can vary. And then, so when we're getting close to closing, we review all of those notices. They'll all show up on your title commitment. And that's when we can look at kind of each individual situation. And remember that if at that point you didn't get the PID notice, you can cure it. You can go back and you can incorporate it into your contract we're also going to get one at final closing to cure up uh, that litigation piece. Okay. All right. Well, that's a question for Nicole. I appreciate you guys and your time today. I know I went over, um, but thanks for the questions. Um, if you do have any further questions, I will put, well, I'll spell my name right in the chat and I'll put my email address here. <laughs> 
and my phone number. And you guys are welcome to call me with questions. Thank you, Leitra. To answer the question in chat, the slides and the recording will be available from your TNT sales rep. So whoever you got the email from that invited you to this class, you can reach out to them probably tomorrow. It takes a little bit of time for us to get the video processed. But if you'll reach out to your TNT sales rep tomorrow, they can absolutely get you a copy of the recording and the slides as well. We um, are so grateful that y'all were with us today. Apologize again for the confusion on the time, um, but we are so so grateful that you were here and hope that you got some good information. I know you got good information and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Miss Leitra. Thanks guys. Y'all have a good day. All right. Bye-bye.